Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Mandy Beal. I'm this congregation's senior minister. I'm joined in leadership of this service by our accompanist companies that can accompany us, Forrest Howell and our cantor, Brian Shandoval. We also have technical support this morning from Mary Jo Ebert and our Zoom greeter is our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030 and then later posted on our website and on our Facebook page. Today's service is a little different. It's a hymn sing. So I just want to remind you that nobody can hear you, that you're on mute. So sing out loud and proud. It's okay. We're here to have fun. And then after the service, we invite you to stay for a virtual coffee hour, especially if you're with us for the first time today. We'd like for you to stay and get to know us and we'd like to get to know you. We have two announcements this morning. The first one is tomorrow at 6 p.m. Join me on Facebook Live for the August edition of Five Questions. Every fourth Monday, I invite a different BUCer for a conversation that is streamed live on our Facebook page. I ask the same four questions each time and then my guest gets to ask me any question, anything at all. So far, it's been kind of interesting and a little weird. Uh, this month, I'll be talking with Brian Shandoval, who you'll get to know a bit today. Brian is the chair of our music committee. To watch us live, join us on the BUC public Facebook page at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Second, we're going to be back in the sanctuary as of September 12th, and that means we need ushers. We will need four ushers every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. to about 11.45. For more details on what it is to be an usher, and to sign up, click on the link in your Thursday email or on the BUC website under worship links. Also, an usher training session will be held on Saturday, September 11th at 10 a.m. in the sanctuary. If you're planning on at, or at all interested in ushering, I encourage you to attend that training. And now, let us join together in worship. First hymn is going to be Gather the Spirit, hymn number 347 in the Gray Hymnal. Now and then, 
gather in hope, compassion and strength, gather to celebrate once again. We worship in our separate homes this morning, but we are joined by a multitude of Unitarian Universalists and lighting our chalice. We light this chalice as a reminder that our lives have their own melodies, harmonies, and cadences, that among the sweet notes, there are always the clunkers, that there are unexpected sharps and flats that surprise us, mm -hmm. that our lives interweave with all of human life across space and time to form one beautiful transcending symphony. Please join me in body and spirit and sing hymn number six in the gray hymnal just as long as I have breath. Just as long as I have breath, I must answer yes to life. Just as long as I lead my way, still with hope I meet each day. If they ask what I did well, tell them I said yes to life. Just as long as vision lasts, I must answer yes to truth. In my dream and in my dark, always that elusive spark. If they ask what I did well, tell them I said yes to truth. Just as long as my heart beats, I must answer yes to love. This appointment pierced me through, still I kept on loving you. If they ask what I did best, tell them I said yes to love. Come this morning from the quietness of your life or from its ear splitting den. Bring with you your hopes for a gentle waltz or some good old fashioned death metal. This morning, we are a church. We are gathered to bear witness to each other's carefully constructed four, four time, totally predictable and straightforward measures and each other's completely atonal, experimental, jazz, chaotic nonsense. We are here to share the precision that makes our lives tolerable and the not quite on the beat that makes our lives interesting. Come, come into this house of mystery and wonder. Leave your expectations of perfection at the door. That won't help you here. Be open to whatever unfolds. Be willing to hear a new song. Be willing to let go, be surprised, and find something beautiful and scary and worthwhile. Please join me in singing hymn number 1020 from the Teal Hymnal, Wo Ya Ya.
let it be known that when Brian and I were talking about that song, he said he would do it just as long as he had breath. <laughs> funny jokes, funny, funny jokes. Um, so I wanted to, you know, say, well, obviously this morning as the person who chose the hymns, I chose my favorites. Um, and I also chose thinking about what, what goes well with piano, and in this case, drums, just thinking about, you know, what we can do well with what we've got. I want to talk a little bit about the selection of Oh Yeah Yeah. Now, this is a hymn that is meta in the, the most meta way possible. We, we don't know how we're going, but we know that we'll get there. It's really great that those are really great lyrics for a song that has a coda and is already set to kind of a, a lilting sort of cadence that, um, you know, frankly, Unitarian Universalist congregations really struggle with. Uh, which has a lot to do with our historical and somewhat current racial composition. Uh, this is a tune that is most closely associated with Yase Barnwell, uh, who was once in Sweet Honey in the Rock and has you know, spent time in UU circles. We'll call Yase Barnwell UU adjacent. Um, Yase Barnwell is often around General Assembly and uh, other, other spaces uh, that are Unitarian Universalist gatherings, especially the ones that are most closely uh, in touch with music. So this, this hymn uh, is, is troublesome and lovely in a lot of ways. And over this past year, uh, Stephen Abha and I were talking a lot about, well, and Nico too, talking a lot about how to handle all ages services, wanting to make sure that our young people know some of our hymns really, really well. Because one of the things that Unitarian Universalism gets wrong is sending our children down to the basement at the beginning of our worship services. And then once a year, expecting them to lead a worship service, having been to none throughout, our, throughout the year. Um, so thinking really hard about how we can help our young people learn our musical tr traditions led us to the conclusion that we should use the same hymns during those all ages services. We use the same hymns for the first half of the year and then two different hymns consistently for the second half of the year. And we chose Will Ya Ya as one of those hymns because we want to make sure everybody knows that song because it is such a beautiful song and it causes people to kind of uh, during the coda part because it kind of goes back to a part that has happened before but not in a way that is readily apparent um, even if you are holding a hymnal because who, who remembers what a coda is if they ever had any musical training. So it's a song that requires you to kind of you know let go. It's one of those ones that we can say in religious circles we have to give it over to the spirit a little bit um, and many of us find that uncomfortable. You know there's um, a bit of a, a, an association with, uh, you know, Unitarian Universalism comes from puritanical roots. We come from literal Puritans. Uh, and it's not, it's not inaccurate to call us the frozen chosen uh, in, in many ways. And we can be very rigid in our uh, expressions of um, religion and worship. This coming year, uh, there's going to be a lot of changes to our liturgy, to, to how we do church. And I'm, I'm looking forward to what that will mean for us in our worship life. And I'm apprehensive <laughs> about what some of the, uh, the reception will be. But it's really important in church that we try to strike the balance between organized and religion. And this is a concept from Dan Hotchkiss, who's a church consultant. Organized meaning we understand what we can expect and we find comfort and repetition and religion as an encounter with the sacred, with the holy, which is always terrifying. Um, if you think about every passage from the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, any encounter with the holy, it starts off with, whoa, 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 be not afraid, be not afraid. I'm just, I'm just here to talk. I'm not here to destroy you, human. Just <laughs> take a second and calm down because um, the holy is uh, something that is other than, that's what that phrase means, something that is other than human, uh, something that's transcendent and outside of the human experience, which is by nature scary. So when we sing, whoa, yeah, yeah, we're singing, we're going somewhere. We don't know where we're going. We don't know how we're going to get there, but we know we're going to get there. We're going to get there together by letting go and letting, letting the whoa, yeah, yeahs come up when they come up by hitting these kind of lilting high notes that sort of climb around in a way that may not be entirely familiar, but we're going to get there and we're going to get there together. And if things get funky, we're going to laugh a little bit about how things got a little, little weird, and then we're just going to keep on going. So, whoa, well, yeah, yeah, indeed, as we move forward into the next phase of our religious life, and as we move forward in discovering and leaning into our Unitarian Universalism. And moving on, one of the ways 
in which we know ourselves as Unitarian Universalists is our commitment to social and environmental justice. We are currently focused on four justice areas that includes environmental action, economic equality, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support this work by sharing our Sunday morning plate with a community partner that shares our values and our commitments. Our recipient through September is one of our partners in economic equality and racial justice work. Walt Whitman Elementary School in Pontiac is one of our most cherished long-term partners. Our work at Walt, Mitt, at Walt Whitman supports learning for K-5 students by stocking and operating a mobile library in the school, conducting a bananas gram program and tutoring. Your offering to this good work can be submitted through Venmo, username at the UCMI, through our website, both of those are easy, free, or you can put a check in the mail, also easy. Half of this morning's offering will be used to buy books for Walt Whitman's library and supplies for the school year. So let there be an offering in support of our congregation and our good works. We move now into a time of prayer and centering, beginning with a sharing of joys and sorrows from the congregation. We always pause the recording here for the sake of discretion. Move further into a spirit of prayer and centering. Spirit and love and life, God of many names and no name at all, mystery that transcends us. This morning, we ask for grace and blessings upon us as a worshiping community. We ask that we find those grace and blessings within each other and within ourselves. We ask that our lives become richer and more full as we explore our Unitarian Universalism and what it means to be human together out loud in public. We ask for love and support for those amongst us who are heartbroken today. And we ask for a magnification of the love and joy of those of us who have just fallen in love with somebody or something. In all of life's twists and turns and ups and downs, may we be held together in the bonds of community. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Life, 
Come to me. Come to me. Next up in our order of hymns today, we have um, what has probably been my favorite hymn for, I don't know, maybe, maybe forever. Um, I absolutely love the hymn, Come Thou Fount. I always have, you know, I grew up in the Presbyterian church. They're slightly different lyrics in a more traditional Christian church. Um, but this hymn is primarily and foundationally a universalist hymn. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what universalism is and, and why this hymn is a universalist hymn. It should be noted that verses one, well, verse one is adapted in our hymn book and verses two and three are written by a, a Unitarian Universalist. So the original, uh, arguably more universalist, I would argue, I would argue that with anybody. Um, but, you know, I, uh, I was once a, a youth director in Presbyterian churches. I was a full service youth director. I came with um, soccer shorts and Nikes and a guitar. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna bring a little bit of that out today. Uh, it has been a minute. But, you know, I think the worst thing that's going to happen here is you'll have a greater appreciation for Stephen Ava. But, um, you know, maybe if you sing loud enough, then uh, it'll give me the confidence that I uh, may not entirely have. <laughs> Let's start off again with a little review of universalism. What is universalism? So Unitarian Universalism is a combination of two traditionally Christian traditions that would never be recognized by the fellowship of Christian churches. Um, more traditional Christians rejected these um, philosophies, these theologies as being heretical, but um, that never bothered us, right? So the Unitarians rejected the concept of the Trinity, believing that it was offensive to divide God. Um, Trinitarian philosophers and theologians would tell you that the Trinity is not a division of God. That's a, that's a point to argue on another day. But the idea that God would spend time in a human form was, 
massively offensive to the Unitarians. A little bit of Gnosticism in there. Also, we'll get to that in the coming church year. So universalism. Universalism has been around since the beginning. Um, there was once an argument um, in the a long, long time ago. So the fourth century, there was this ongoing debate about um, you know, whether uh, salvation was about sacrificial atonement or whether it meant something about everybody being included in the grace of God. Um, again, a couple people got burned, <laughs> a couple people uh, were banished, uh, but we draw on those heretical roots as well. So universal salvation is the implication that the, um, the death and resurrection of Jesus granted that universal salvation to everybody. Um, the Christian folklore is that in the days between the crucifixion and the resurrection, that uh, Jesus, as, as the Christ, um, redeemed all souls that were in hell and then sealed hell. Now that is, again, that's not biblical, that's folklore, but a beautiful thought nonetheless. Uh, so it seemed to universalists that the idea of Jesus as God uh, meant that what would be the point of a death and resurrection of a God unless it applied to everybody? That if all people are children of God, then, then that um, act, the, the work of the cross was meant for everybody. So for the more modern universalists in the United States, uh, the concept was that God's redeeming work was done. God's work in the story of salvation was done, but we were all still here and there was still war, there was still violence, there was still poverty. So what's left to do? If God has done God's work, then that means that there is work left for humanity to do. So it was humanity's job then to create the kingdom of God or the beloved community as it is sometimes called on earth. So the universalists were pacifists. They believed in justice and equity. Uh, they took on social work um, in its traditional form, not the profession that it is now as an expression of their Christianity. This is where in the, the song, we hear the lion and the young, young lamb dwell together in thy home. That of course is a biblical reference. But if a lamb is forced to lie down with a lion, that is not justice. It is not about putting lions and lambs together and seeing what happens. It's about working with lions so that they don't want to eat lambs. This is about finding a way in which people can live together without needing to oppress or feeling the need to ex uh, oppress and exploit one another. We also see in this hymn, the line about proving God's goodness through our action, throwing, showing God's love in real practical ways. Uh, the, the lyric is, our works telling of God's love. Feel our love glow like the sun. Uh, yeah, may we still thy goodness prove, right? So it's about the requirement of humanity to prove God's goodness, that God works through humanity, right? So what we find in universalism uh, and in this song and this hymn is the tension between a belief in life's perfection you know, the, for the hope of life's perfection and yet needing God to make us fit to reach that perfection. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Help us find ourselves in union. Help our hands tell of our love. With God's aid, universalists believe humanity can make manifest in this world the grace, love, and peace that God has already made manifest in the afterlife through the act of universal salvation. Basically, God did God's part and now it's humanity's part to figure it out here on this, on this plane of existence. So <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that is uh, most beautiful and also a little, um, you know, like, ah, oh, honey, about <laughs> traditional Unitarian Universalism is the concept of the progress of mankind onward and upward forever. There are five points of liberal religion or liberal theology. They are directly correlated with the five points of Calvinism. They were basically the progressives of the time of the, uh, the mid 19th century were trolling the Calvinists. Uh, Calvinism was used as a tool of oppression against the working class. It's where we get the idea of the Protestant work ethic that God's uh, favoritism on you or favor on you was demonstrated through your physical wealth. That's gross, we don't believe that. So, you know, the idea was that rather than waiting for treasures to be stored in heaven, the universalists believe in bringing heaven, bringing those treasures, those spiritual treasures to this world. Calvinism told the working class, keep on working, your treasures in heaven, you don't need to worry about your conditions on earth, it doesn't matter what's happening on earth, things are going to be great in heaven, get back in the factory, who cares if you miss a limb, 
right? And the universalists were like, no, no, that's not, that's not what it's about. We need to bring those treasures to this, um, to this world and to this existence. So no, nobody needs to lose their limbs at the factory. So the reason that this is a little like, oh honey, is um, modernism, right? There's a bit of hubris to the idea of the progress of mankind onward and upward forever. It's a beautiful concept and I love it. And I want to think about the possibility of humanity um, always improving the idea of like the world of Star Trek where there is no oppression and everybody gets along and everybody has what they need. That's science fiction. So the idea of, of that is beautiful and the reality of reaching it, I think we have demonstrated that, uh, that we can't. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can, but in its own way, this idea of the progress of, of mankind, of humankind onward and upward forever became a tool of oppression in its own way. The universalists thought they had the right idea about how people should live in order to bring about this kingdom of heaven. They thought, well, everybody needs to have equal access to all of the things that lead to a healthy life. And the reason people commit crimes and the reason that people drink is because they don't have what they need or they don't know any better. And it was the they don't know any better that got out of hand because it's only a hop, skip and a jump from trying to prevent typhus uh, to, you know, making everybody be in a certain way. And that's that's what happened. There's a dark history with, well, that's a that's a racist term. There is an unfortunate and sad history with universalism that, that led to the eugenics movement. And we have to know that. And we have to be able to talk about that if we're going to talk about universalism. Universalists shared a social location. Many of them were rural, but they weren't typically the exploited class. They could imagine reconciliation with the people who harmed them, the people who took advantage of them, but not everybody could or can. Our inability to reconcile the theodicy question has prevented uh, modern universalism from really being a thing. The theodicy question of how is there a good and loving God when there's evil in the world, right? When people have suffered unspeakable evil because of systemic oppression, it's then hard to say, well, everybody gets into heaven though because of universal salvation. Um, it's a little bit more palatable to people believe, to believe that there is good and evil and there is right and wrong. So postmodernism with its skepticism and its relativity has actually made universalism even harder, right? If there is no ultimate good for which we are striving, then universalism loses some of its meaning. So the dichotomy of heaven and hell was banished by universalism because there was no hell. There was just a, um, an earth that was lacking <laughs> um, and in our modern sensibility, I think, um, you know, the concept of heaven and hell has lost a lot of resonance for many Unitarian Universalists. So universalism in our time, what are we doing with universalism as a part of Unitarian Universalism? I have said before, and I will say again, that I'm much more of a universalist than I am a Unitarian. That's not necessarily because, um, well, so here's the thing. <laughs> To me, the idea that it is our responsibility to have a theological um, response to the world makes a lot of a sense. It makes a lot of sense. I think there's a lot of appeal to if we're going to get something done on this planet, then we have to do it. We have to do it for ourselves, right? And if we can't, as um, you know, theological people, as thinkers about ultimate questions, if we say that, you know, that there's not a God that's going to punish us and that God doesn't make good things happen in our lives, then we also cannot use God as some sort of um, you know, whipping boy either, right? If God is not our big daddy in the sky who fixes things and God is also not the one who's responsible for bad things that happen on our planet, we have to take responsibility for everything that happens here because that's us, and that's us doing that. Now, if we think about humanity in terms of being uh, the, the manifestation of the works of God, I still think that it's up to us to make things work. I think that the, the argument still holds water. So how do we learn from the mistakes of universalism? It's again, this dichotomy of naivete and brutality of, you know, everything is great. We can build the kingdom of God and all we have to do is, you know, have temperance and put everybody in school. <laughs> and then also the brutality of, um, we have to put everybody in school and then teach them white culture, right? Um, everybody who was a universalist primarily uh, was a was a white 
middle class person at the time, not exclusively, but it was uh, universalism became a tool for transmitting white supremacy culture, right? Assuming that everybody had to be the same, that's always going to be pro problematic, right? That's just a, a tool of hegemony. So, how do we take this concept of um, everybody is okay, that salvation exists for everyone, that goodness exists for everyone, um, without erasing the history of brutality and without turning that into a tool of brutality? Because there's a difference between everybody has equal footing and everybody's the same. Right, so we need to learn how to uh, how to be cognizant of that as Unitarian Universalists. Also, this idea of constructing norms for good and evil, um, right and wrong, right living, good action. We do actually need some of that so that we can hold people accountable. Now, relativism can be a slippery slope, and it is often used to excuse bad behavior. It is problematic when one group gets together and says this is what's right and wrong for everybody. It is equally problematic to say, well, maybe it is okay for them to do that, right? I was just following my truth when I did whatever terrible thing, right? So we need to be able to talk about things in terms of what is harmful and what is healthy in our lives, but to not turn that into, um, again, that, that tool of oppression. The other thing I think we need to take from classic universalism and um, draw forward for our modern Unitarian Universalism, um, well, okay, so this is, this is what didn't happen that we need to happen. It's acknowledging human limitations. We need to get rid of this progress of mankind onward and upward forever. It's a, it's a great story that isn't accurate. So we have a tendency to enact power and oppression on each other. And we know that this is a part of our tendency because it is historically true. When 100% of human history indicates that we will always find ways to oppress each other, it's a pretty good indication that we will continue to find that way. Right. Um, I almost always like to pull from Ecclesiastes. There is nothing new under the sun. We will continue to find ways to be awful to each other, although they are new and exciting ways. We will continue to find ways to be awful to each other. So anytime that we set up a construct of good and evil, right and wrong, we have to acknowledge um, the boundless ability that we have to use those systems to oppress each other. I feel like I'm kind of repeating our, myself, but there's some nuances here. There's a tension that we have to draw between believing in life's perfection and then needing God to make us fit to reach that perfection. And, and that tension is what is encapsulated in this hymn that I find so compelling. Uh, the word God has a lot of resonance for me and I acknowledge that it doesn't for everybody. It's rare that I talk about my own beliefs, but today kind of seemed like the day, the day to do that. So if, if we need to reframe that, if I need to reframe that, we'll call it um, the transcendent, right? So the tension between believing in life's perfection and needing something outside of ourselves to make us fit to reach that. And it's the same, it's the same tenor, right? We have this goal that we can never get to. So we have to draw on something besides us because we've proven that we can't get to it to get to it. And if that's the power of more than one person, the power of community getting there, that, that works just as well. So we're going to close with for all that is our life, thinking about all the different parts of our lives and how they come together to um, give us guidance in the, the messy and beautiful life that we share together. Yes, thank, thank you for joining me in, in one of my favorite hymns. For all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift, which we are called to use to build the common good. And make our own days glad. For needs which others serve, for services we give, for work and its rewards, for hours of rest and love, we come with praise and thanks. For all that is our life, for sorrow we must bear, for failures, pain, and loss, 
For each new thing we learn, for fearful hours that pass, we come with praise and thanks. For all that is our life, For all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift, which we are called to use to build the common good and make our own days glad. So go now out into this world and build the common good, make your own days glad and, and do so with a sense of care and sensitivity to those around you, building their common good as well from the perspective that they might see it. May it be so, amen and blessed be.